does America do a good job of honoring the civil rights of its students that have unique needs in American public schools? We're gonna talk about it today on Freedom Friday. Welcome to Freedom Friday. It is Friday and you are still not free, but hopefully you will be freer after this hour with Sharif el Mecki and me. Sharif el Mecki, how you doing, brother? Doing well, man. Good to see you. Happy Friday. Happy Freedom Friday. Um, really uh, excited about this conversation today, you know, particularly as a school principal that, you know, this was, uh, you know, this is an important part of our work. Um, and I think it's also emblematic of marginalized communities. Um at large, you know, in, in um, society, so. Well, today we're talking about students, the civil rights of students who have special needs uh, as pertains to their education and in public schools. I think there's always a reminder that we have to give ourselves that there's many ways to marginalize people. Uh, there are many ways to make sure that there are people that are not included in the mainstream of opportunity in the United States. And just when you think that you have uh, started addressing one area of marginalization, you find that if you're a mature adult, a mature person who likes to learn, you find yet another population and another way in which people are being marginalized. If you're a compassionate person, you care about it and you do take the time to learn all that you can. One way to learn is to talk to people that know more than you do about the issue. One way to learn is to talk to people that have uh, evidence and understand research and understand how to study these issues so that they can share with you. What we do here at Freedom Friday is we try to make it a communal learning opportunity so that uh, I reduce my ignorance. Sharif el Mikey has no ignorance, but to the extent that he does, he tries to uh, reduce his and we try and share that with you, our audience, the people who come uh, here to listen to us talk week after week uh, and hopefully share in the communal learning opportunity. I'd like to bring in our guest today, Lauren Mirando Rim. Uh, and Lauren, if I uh, say your name wrong, please, people. No, you got it. Show, uh, good. People who watch the show often enough know that I am uh, not a name person. I'm not good with it at all, but I always try. Um, welcome to the show today. Really appreciate having you here. Um, we uh, we got a report um, that we would love to talk about with you and ha have you kind of uh, unpack some of the key findings um, with us. Uh, 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 the report is from the Center for Learner uh, Equity, and it's a secondary analysis of the most recent civil rights data collection to inform policy and practice. Uh, that's a big long name, Lauren. By the way, you know, as some first, as someone who likes to brand things, uh, that's a big long name. Um, but I've I've found that um, that there were multiple findings. How many are there total? Uh, I went through last night. There are multiple findings. I want to say that there's five or six, and each one of them felt like they could be a discussion mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of questions to ask why. But can you just help us uh, help ground us in the report itself and the main findings? and anything in it that you think is the most important thing for people who are just coming to the issue to understand and to learn. Sure, um, great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I, we always appreciate any you know conversation and additional learning about this issue that um, I and the team at the Center for Learning Equity really cares about. I had to laugh when you said mouthful. We used to be the National Center for Special Ed and Charter Schools. So the Center for Learning <laughs> Equity is a huge improvement over that. Um, so yeah, we do love our acronyms and long titles in education, don't we? Um, so uh, our organization is committed to um, ensuring that kids with displays of access to charter schools and higher quality opportunities in general. Um, and so as part of our work every two years, we analyze the federally, uh, the, off, the U.S. Department of Ed Office for Civil Rights does this massive survey of all the public schools in the nation, and they release the data, and it's called the Civil Rights Data Collection. It really focuses on issues related to students' civil rights and whether they're being met. 
So as part of our work, every two years, we do this secondary, you know, the U.S. Department of Ed collects all the data, compiles it, puts it out there, and researchers like the folks on my team then crunch the data for specific things they're interested in. So that's what our report is, is looking at data. We want to understand what is the experience of kids with disabilities in charters. And so this is our fifth or fourth analysis since we launched um, where we look at the experience of kids with disabilities in charters and traditional public schools. So there's the groundwork. Um, the, the, the key data points that we look at are what percentage of kids in charters have disabilities. Um, and we know, you know, and the first thing is, is that there's this myth that charters don't serve kids with disabilities, but our data, we're looking at about 330, 335,000 kids with disabilities enrolled with charters across the country. So just kind of as a foundation that there is um, a large number of kids with disabilities in charters. However, there is still a gap between traditional public schools and charters. Traditional public schools, it's around 13.2% of the population are kids with disabilities in charters. It's around 11%, 10.7. So there is a gap there between the two sectors, which um, is of interest in, in our work to understand what contributes to it. Um, notice, notably, the gap had been going down for about 10 years in the last four years, the gap seems to be increasing between charters and districts, um, which we're not really sure of what's leading to that trend. Um, and you should note these data, because they're federal and they're huge, we're talking about 17, 18 data, this is all pre-COVID. Um, anyway, so there is an ongoing difference between charters and traditional district schools. We also look at the composition of the kids, because typically when we talk about special ed, we talk about it as if it's a homogenous group and it's not. It's, hugely heterogeneous. You know, there are 13 categories of kids with disabilities and there are kids who have really moderate needs and might need an hour or two of services a week. And then there are kids who have really intensive needs. So mm -hmm. talking about special ed, it's important to know that it's, there's, there's a huge variety. Um, and we looked at traditional and charters and compared. And what we saw is that, that charters are educating um, an equally diverse rep group of kids with disabilities. There are some mild, mo you know, modest differences between the two sectors. Uh, charters tend to enroll slightly greater percentage of kids with specific learning disabilities and slightly fewer kids with who have really intensive needs who are typically served in more segregated settings um, and fewer kids with intellectual disabilities. But um, overall, there is more variety in charters and certainly... I think the narrative is that you hear about who charters are serving. We also know that charters are serving kids in more inclusive settings. So one of the one of the data points is what what percentage of kids with disabilities are spending the day in the general ed classroom versus in separate settings, and charters are serving a greater proportion, around eighty percent of the kids with disabilities in the general ed classroom compared to traditional district schools, which is around sixty five percent of the kids. Um, the final major data point that I just want to talk about is discipline, is that um, discipline is a huge issue um, with for kids with disabilities. They're generally disciplined at two and three times the rate, especially when we talk about black boys. Hmm. Um, and so we continuously look at that. And what we see is that charters and district schools are pretty similar. And in the, the high level takeaways for the data related discipline is much less about the difference between charters and districts, but really about kids in general ed versus special ed, and that it, you know, pretty consistently twice as many kids with disabilities are being disciplined in both types of schools. So I'll stop there. That's, those are the high level data points that we tend to spend a lot of time talking about that really drive and inform our work. Can I just ask about the first one around the disparity? I don't know if it's a disparity, but the difference in the percentages um, of, uh, of young people with special education needs in charter schools and district schools. Mm -hmm. um, I looked at the data and I like, you know, <laughs> I need to understand this better how like from a research perspective, this works. But uh, when you match charter schools against all traditional public schools, it does not feel like an apples to apples comparison. It seems like it would be more apples to apples if you compare charter school students to like likely situated or demographically likely situated students within the traditional system, not the entire system. Because entire system includes like entire kind of affluent white community public schools. I mean, yeah, you know, like district, traditional district schools. Like, you know, I can think of a district near me that has 
very few people of color, very few people in poverty, very few uh, uh, kids. As a matter of fact, they're sending a lot of their kids with special education to the next district over and saying, you know, well, they have all the right services for you or whatnot, mm -hmm. but they get counted in with the traditional public school numbers writ large, even though they're not serving the same population as, as charter schools. Is there anything to that? Um, I mean, yes and no. I think, you know, one of the things with the civil rights data collection is that it's huge. Like the numbers are huge. And, and so when you start talking about averages, a lot of those, that variance evens out. And so while there may be some highs and lows in there, when we talk about huge, huge databases like that, they tend to be a little bit of noise rather than really skewing it. But also special ed, I, I think reading into your question, is it that, is it that, urban communities have more kids with disabilities and suburban have fewer and that because charters are enrolling more urban because, and where I'm going with this is that special ed identification rates don't, don't correlate with, with poverty or affluence and that we actually see on both ends that, that really affluent communities tend to have pretty high rates of special ed and there's all kinds of data around Section 504 and kids getting identified for services because they want to get more testing time. And then the other end, um, when there's really high poverty levels, we tend to have more health issues and lack of prenatal care and other things that contribute to special ed. So the there's the trends aren't correlated. You know, so many things in education, you can draw direct correlations to the relative wealth of the district and special ed isn't the same. So. I'm not sure if that was the where you're going with the question. But. Well, I think because I, I think I have a question that's similar, that's adjacent to uh, Chris's. Uh, you know, my question is, that, and again, is it goes back to the comparison of a charter to a district. So, for example, you know, students who are more, uh, you know, one, a, a charter, a standalone charter in particular, yeah, they may not have students in that, depending on where they serve, they're in a, a particular neighborhood, then they get, you know, uh, they're open to whoever, whatever students are in that uh, vicinity. Uh, a district is has a much wider, you know, catchment area, right? And so automatically it skews it a little bit. But then there, there's some nuance in there, right? Because I think sc individual schools can hide behind, uh, you know, a term of a, a district. So if you have a, a binary column charter in these individuals or, you know, uh, a district, you know, most district schools for students who have the most restrictive environment, the district sends a lot of those students who need the, you know, the most intense care to a select group of schools that they're pouring resources in. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it may it may look one way and you compare the rest of the, you know, that school to a typical charter. Then it's like, whoa, you don't have anyone who fits this category. But neither do most of the district schools, you know. And yeah, so it's just, yeah. I think sometimes like uh, people use it in a in a way. And I agree with you. Like it's you know for a variety of different reasons, you know. Um, and then I, one other nuance I would add is there are some um, some charters. I'm not saying all of them, but there are particular charters in my experience where families that have students with special needs um, are actually t sending them to you know to charters for additional support, for the likelihood of them being in that general population, we call it least restricted environment. But I, don't, you know, but I think you and I are going to try not to be too technical this morning uh, with our right. audience, right? You know, so right. um, I think that's another, you know, variance of it where they're like, hey, my student, my child will be with their peers and in a, you know, a general ed classroom instead of separate. So I think that's also a really important part of the story that doesn't get often told in the, in the regular reporting. Yeah. No, and it, what, so I've been doing work on special in the charter sector for, gosh, I'm going to show my age, 25 plus years since the very beginning of the charter sector. And really one of the key defining attributes for charters is, are they considered a district? Because in places like Philadelphia and uh, New Jersey, charter Pennsylvania and, Philadelphia and uh, New Jersey, uh, charters are considered their own district. So technically, legally, financially, they have the same funding flow and responsibility as, say, a Minneapolis public schools or a Philadelphia public schools. 
Whereas well, you know, there's a lot of conversation about that, but you go ahead, keep going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then in other places, other states like Florida and Colorado, charters are considered part of a district. And so in those states, we actually, and that's one of the reasons that in the report, we present some of the data according to the legal status. And what we see is that charters that operate as districts have more kids with disabilities than charters that operate as part of a district. Um, for exactly the reasons you're talking about is that if you operate as part of a district, and let's just say a, a child comes in with really significant disabilities and they have a lot of support needs, then the district and the charter might sit down in the students, you know, the planning meeting, the individualized education program meeting, where they look at the child's needs and make decisions. And the charter and the district might say, you know what, we have a program, we have a specialized program, and we've got, you know, established expertise, we're going to recommend that the child go there rather than this charter. Um, and so that's why we see in charters that operate as part of their district, even fewer kids with disabilities. So can you talk so, about APS? Oh, sorry, Chris, go ahead. Well, no, I just I want to stick on this point kind of as a lay person, because I always wonder about why this is important, the data point around like, you yeah. know, whether the, whether school A or school B has so much of this population or that population, because it feels to me that like a lot of schools develop, not every school is for everybody, right? So even like I, I would, as I was looking through this last night, I had a question around, you know, uh, for the longest time, charter schools and magnet schools were roughly the same number of schools, but magnet schools always evaded questions like this. Like I actually did a Google search last night to see how many um, special education students are served by magnet schools and literally couldn't find the data. Yeah, I couldn't no, find the information. And I was like, well, wait a second now. Why is it that everything with charter schools is always under the microscope, right? Like uh, just <laughs> I'm going to stop there, right? Like you don't serve enough of these students or that students or you serve too many Black students, you know, you're segregated because you serve too many of a kind of student or you're more poor than the regular schools. So, so it almost feels like these data points have nothing to do with, is this school doing something for the population that they serve? Yeah, there's a couple of things in there. There, there you have a whole conversation about why the attention that charters get that magnets don't get. It is, it is, and we're actually doing some work in a state right now where we're seeing huge differences that char that magnets are not serving many kids with disabilities. And oh, by the way, the magnets are getting a whole lot more money, but there are no major complaints. And we all know why, like different, different groups are excited about magnets than they're excited about charters, right? Um, but that's a, that's a different conversation. But <laughs> for us, I mean, what drove me to this work was that kids with disabilities are not getting served well period, like put aside the charter question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then you mm -hmm. had these new schools that came into the scene in the early 1990s. And it was, we're going to, we're going to do more with less and we're going to do better. And we're going to do, we're going to be mission driven and we're going to create these great opportunities for parents. And I agree with all of that. I think that's amazing. However, when you start to look at it and you realize well, charters are going to hold up and say, well, we're doing better, we're offering these great opportunities, but we're not really going to make it work for those kids. It seemed like a missed opportunity. And that's really what drives our work is how do we work and support the charter sector to use the autonomy they have to do really cool things for kids with disabilities so that kids with disabilities aren't left in, those, in the schools that aren't serving them well, or that they aren't able to take advantage of that really cool arts-based program or that Montessori program or that STEM program, whatever the program is, that they, they should have equal access. And we'd love to see charters have the ability to, do, to apply that you know, innovation and best practices to benefit kids with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. our work is from the perspective of how do we improve opportunities for kids with disabilities? It's not, it's not how do we make charters the same as district schools? It's kind of a- <laughs> Or equally like, bad. Yeah. Or equally bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's question for you about this too. I noticed in the data I was looking through it that there's, okay, I got lost in the methodology and I didn't really like, you know, I, I thought, okay, this is not my part of the report to read, Sorry. but I'm going to, I'm going to try. I'm going to like, yeah. you know, listen. Um, but there, when it started coding the different types of disabilities, 
uh, in one one part of the methodology here, I started thinking to myself, I wonder how different these are, these different disabilities yeah. in terms, like do um, it feel it feels like in the fairly affluent parts of the district that I was uh, a school board member in, autism started getting a lot more attention for yes. a period of time and other areas of disability were not getting as much of attention. So we were losing whole populations of, mm -hmm. of with them. What's the, um, how does this, everything that you're saying right now, these data points, how does it shake out for the different uh, disabilities? And is there uh, some bright spots for some where there aren't for others, or is it, you know, kind of consistent across all disabilities? Yeah. Um, so my background is research and the questions you're surfacing are the same questions I have. So just to first level, there are huge limitations to the data from CRDC. It's national and it gives us lots of information about large national ten trends, but there's not a lot of nuance there. So what we don't know is that the population of kids with autism or other health impairment or uh, specific learning disabilities in state A are, is the same as state B. You know, there are some disability categories that have very specific, I would say objective um, uh, criteria for being identified. Um, like if you have a hearing impairment, that's something that is fairly relative or easy to identify and objectively measure. However, when we start talking about things like emotional disturbance and learning disabilities, there's a lot more gray area and subjectivity and identification. Mm -hmm. So I think if I'm understanding your question, the short answer is we don't know. We don't, we don't know that, that the population is the same from place A to place B, but we do know that, and this is where you start looking at some of the trends, you know, why is it that if you look um, and I, these statistics aren't right, but if you if you look in Kentucky, in some states, like the percentage of kids in special ed, like 50% of those kids are identified as specific learning disabilities. And you go to another state and it's only 25% of the kids in special ed. And you think, okay, there's something going on there. There's something about regional local identification that is contributing to that. And then when you lay over race mm -hmm. and 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 some of the factors that we know about some of the systemic racism that feeds into the special ed pipeline. Um, you know, anecdotally, what I've heard when I've been in districts, big urban districts with high percentages of black and brown children is that you see kids, not as many, more kids getting identified as having cognitive impairments and specific learning disabilities. So I think we do see trends like that. And there's a whole area of work at the federal level on just proportionality of, how do we make sure that there aren't biases? Well, I shouldn't say, how do we address the biases that we know are in the system so that doesn't happen? So that so that kids, we have the, the appropriate expectations for kids and high expectations for kids. I think it's fair to say that the expectations for kids with disabilities overall are way too low. And then you layer in the intersectionality between race and disability and it's, it's um, it's hugely problematic. I'm trying to think of the right way to describe it. <laughs> and um, Sharif, I want to ask you, Sharif, because like, you know, you led a school, you were in, in a community where you, I'm sure this, you had to think about this uh -oh. and with your own population, but for the black community, it feels to me like this discussion is uh, not always easy to unpack. For the longest time, we heard about over-identification for special education services. We also heard really gross stories of people thinking that they could get social security money if they label their kids. We've also heard of over medication of our kids, over medicating of our kids. And just to make things confounding with what researchers do to us, a year or two, maybe two, three years ago, I think out of Fordham, they produced this big report and all this research that said uh, that we're not identified enough for special That's education. Matter. Like, so. On one hand, we were being told we're being identified too much. And then research came out and said, we're not being identified enough and we're left in the middle somehow. What do we do, Sharif? How do we yeah. make sense of these things? <laughs> Listen, for, you know, first thing as, as a principal, I would always want to just make sure that I'm, uh, I hire great people around me um, mm -hmm. that I trusted that, that were, you know, you, you started off the show, like we asked those who, who know, right? And, and to make sure that that was part of it. And the other part is like just around the culture and trust uh, building necessary with within the school as well as within the communities. Like all that you said 
is is true. And then you factor in things that we know uh, that research says impacts, you know, lead. And what's the percentage of, you know, lead paint in certain um, areas and places mm. like Philadelphia, those mm. older cities? How does that play into it? When I first became a principal, they I remember there was something, the guidelines from the state, mind you, was if the child was two grade levels, I think it was two grade levels behind in like reading, they could be considered for a special ed. So imagine what, you know, that population, you know, that could be, I mean, I, I can't even imagine Um you know, if that actually played out the way that those uh, those guidelines said, um, because you're talking about a massive amount of students. Um, and then on top of that, you also have to those biases, uh, you know, some of just outright racism, but yeah. is is uh, so important and not just with with the, the academic side, the cognitive side, but the emotional side, because it, it comes with such prejudice of well, that person is, that child is oppositional defiant, you know, has an oppositional defiant disorder. And I'm like, you know what, the way you described that kid, like that was, I had, I had that when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I actually, I actually had that. You know? my, my six-year-old has I still that. have it. Yeah. I'm just I like, have it right now. and so if you want to, and then the thing about it, those are the students in particular who are usually, they may be pushing back for very good reasons. And guess what? They end up isolated. And so it's not like they go to a, a, a room and they're getting intervention. Then they come back. Often they're there for years. Right. Like they get stuck there for years. And then you just see that trajectory of that child who was bright and challenging. But they were also challenging the system. They were challenging how they were being taught. They were challenging the conditions that people were forcing them to learn in. And then they end up in basically in, um, you know, in prison, they say it's it's a. Uh, you know, it's a, a, a crime against humanity to mm. put someone in in, uh, in isolation for a long time. Well, these students are in academic isolation for a long time. And then it's just as Lauren said, when you start tracking as mm -hmm. far as like where, what happens to students, the population of students that, uh, you know, have been identified with uh, uh, special needs um, in prisons um, is horrific. Like, I mean, it is, you can't look at it and just say, oh, that's just like. And you often talk about starter prisons and all this kind of stuff in school, and not the school to prison pipeline, just school no, to prison. Take the two right? out. If you take look, the school out, yeah. <laughs> the schools are starter prisons. It is absolutely. And and Lauren, another thing I would love for you to address at some point during the show is, you know, uh, how students with special needs should be addressed. You know, before people call them, uh, you know, special needs kids or special ed kids or or whatever. And it's been, you know, for years now, like really trying to move the population to center their humanity first. So I'd love for you to talk about, you know, um, talk about that as, as well. Yeah. So, so much there. I, two things I want to talk about language, but the first thing is, is that, you know, you look at the system we've created and we shouldn't be surprised. Like this is all mm -hmm. predictable. You put a kid in school, right. you, you don't, you don't provide them with strong teachers. You don't provide them with supports they may need because they struggle and then they may struggle. And so then they act out like, this behavior is communication. Like if a kid is acting out, then you say, well, why is a kid acting out? And if, if it, in an unbiased system, you'd say that child must be struggling. Let's figure out why. But a system that has the inherent bias that they do, they're like, well, that's a bad kid. And we're going to put them on this track. And that track is a dead end track that happens all the time. Um, and so we shouldn't be surprised that we have these outcomes that we do. Um, if, we, if we don't provide the sports, and it's always one of the questions, and it's actually one of the questions I ask when I go into charters that have super inclusive environments. I'm like, oh, that's great. Like you're getting kids in the general classroom with a teacher, but I want to see your discipline rates because if I see that you've put all these kids with disabilities in the general classroom and I see really high discipline rates, that's kind of a red flag to say, hey, are the kids getting the supports they need to be successful? Because high discipline typically means that kids are acting out because they're frustrated. They're not having success. So there's a there's a Let me cycle. quickly ask about that too, Lauren. When you say high discipline, are you specifically talking about suspensions, yes. expulsions, um, yes. removal from the classroom, and redirection to what some schools call a citizenship room? Um, <laughs> oh, is that what they're called now? All kind yeah. of names. All kind of citizenship names. room. Um, um, 
but those feel like different levels of discipline and yeah. charters I know use those differently. Like charters will remove you from a classroom if you're being disruptive, but oftentimes that doesn't mean that your education ends at that point. They put you in another place where you are still receiving high dosages of tutoring and, and keeping you on track where some schools, especially in districts, have more of the dis the citizenship rooms. They not only remove you, but they put you into a room with a para uh, who has no specialized training or no capability of continuing your education, uh, which I know is something that we talked about a lot locally here. We talked a lot about that because those discipline room, citizenship rooms were filling up yeah. um, and we saw the numbers, but we didn't know how to talk about discipline because most people conflated it just with suspension. Right. You know, euphemisms, I want to come back to the language part because I think that's really important. And you talking about citizens room makes me think more about it. But, you know, there the, the most recent our analysis of this year, uh, some of our data collection found that traditional district schools use in-school suspension more and charters tend to use out-of-school suspension more. I don't know this. My hunch is that that's far more about facilities than anything is that district schools tend to have larger buildings that they can create those spaces and charters typically don't. We also anecdotally have seen a fair amount of um, what my colleagues call subterranean discipline. And there was just a new report that came out this week about all schools of kind of discipline that's occurring that's not being called discipline. Like a child with a disability, the parent gets called six times in a day or the parent is told they have to come pick their child up mid midday. So mm. there's different manifestations of that. And I wanna make sure that we don't, um, you know, the in-school suspension thing, I, there's a facilities component to that, um, that we don't see as much in-school suspension in district schools and charter schools. Um, the language thing is super important. Um, and what, and I try to pay really close attention to it because obviously I talk about uh, kids with disabilities a lot and disabilities in general. What I've seen very clearly from disability advocates is do not step away from the word disability. That special needs is seen as all people have special needs, humans have needs, and to call them special is kind of belittling, belittling rather, um, and special needs and... Um, differently abled, like all of these words that we use to dance around the word disability are do not land well with individuals with disabilities. And so when talking about special ed, it's always people first, like kids with disabilities or kids who receive special ed, special ed is not a place, kids aren't special ed kids. So I think when in doubt, just default to the word disability, kids with disabilities. Um, and that we should not shy away from using that word. So I don't know if that if that answers your question, but. I do want to like log in on that one just a little bit. Let me log in on it. Uh, I believe that's a case by case basis. Yes, I believe that's a, that's a family thing. I don't talk my business, but I do believe that in some cases we are talking about a special education need that is actually an asset and not a disability, right? It does require special attention. Um, but it's actually a gift and not a actual disability in my mind. Like people can come to their conclusions about these things differently. When I worked uh, for Goodwill Easter Seals uh, years ago uh, and they specialize in working with people with disabilities and getting jobs and, and whatnot. One of the tricks of the job in helping people find their life path and jobs and, and housing and other things is to find their gifts in certain situations because not everything that's labeled a disability is really like ability, it is not really always being disabled. It's actually a thing that has a very, it's, anyways, I don't wanna go on to it too yeah. much. Yeah. My main oh, point is saying this is family by family and case school by, by case school, basis yeah. and school by yeah. school. Um, I'm gonna take the point to heart that overall the disability yes. community has this, uh, has this preference. And, and I'm going to also say in specific, some families might view this differently. Yeah, and I, would, I would even say it, like in our school, um, it was always, you know, uh, with needs about special needs, specialized needs. Uh, matter of fact, the department was uh, student support services. So it was actually looked at as 
but supports hell, hell like you know we're all wearing glasses <laughs> that would be considered a special need to help us you know mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know provide equity so that we're able to see so we just looked at it you know as i said the whole department that provided support uh was called student support services um and that's the team that was uh you know was working to provide support and some of the supports were more intensive some were less um, some were configured in different ways. Some needed support, you know, uh, mornings or during transitions. Some would need support at the end of the day or, you know, large, not in the cafeteria, too many people, you know, like it was a whole range of, of, of needs. And I would say the other part that I think we haven't spoken about, I think is, is probably the most important part of, is the training development um, of the educators. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just like mm -hmm. how students are struggling or, or not. It's a matter of like who who's developing the educators who are leading classrooms and supporting students, leading IEP meetings, uh, you know, uh, building relationships with families, like all of that. You know, the the development necessary for for the adults who are getting paid is absolutely horrific, you know, and I think that is probably that is more closely aligned to the outcome students are receiving than whatever the students uh need in terms of supports. Right. And I, I think that the, you know, I would, I would never correct a family or an individual, obviously. Um, and as Shreve mentioned, it's, it's about systems. Like mm -hmm. there's, there's how we speak globally and kind of like, this is the default, but mm -hmm. within, within the disability community, like most of the time it's people first. The messaging I'm reading from the autism community is that as you said, people don't see it as a disability. They say, I'm autistic. It's a gift. It's what I am. I hear mm -hmm. that um, from people who have hearing impairments as well, that, you know, that they don't see it as a impairment. It's just a different language that they use ASL rather than the spoken word. So um, that's a key thing is that it's not this righteous, oh, there's one way. But what I found is enter from a place of deep respect and um, humanizing and equity and that, and, and recognize sometimes you're going to say things are wrong and sometimes you're going to say things are right, but that to enter it from a position of respect from those involved as a system where we see it as sometimes this othering that goes on in schools. Mm -hmm. Like when I go into a school and I start walking around talking to a principal, I'm listening to how they talk about kids with disabilities and they're like, Oh, that's the sped section or that's the sped classroom. Mm -hmm. I wrestle. I was like, the, the the principal has othered that community. They're not part of the school community. And so I listen to the language. And then I ask more questions. Um, you know, we have a, a colleague, Rashawn Biddle, yeah. in our uh, in our sphere, who used to write about this a long time ago. He used to call it special education ghettos yes. uh, in schools. And he used to write about this as a thing. Like he kept writing about it. He wanted to, people to know that, you know, a lot of special education uh, as ghettoized and um, on purpose, like, you know, it's like intentional and systemic and uh, like you are uh, routed into places where you will for sure get a lesser education yeah. uh, on purpose, <laughs> given right. the worst teachers in some cases or the worst materials or the, you know, uh, when I was on a school board, touring schools was a big thing for me and visuals are important to me. Mm -hmm. And we had schools that had no windows, right? We had like entire floors of schools that had no windows. Uh, I'm thinking of one in particular uh, in the middle of Minneapolis that was actually literally designed in the 1970s to be riot proof. And um, <laughs> to, cause they had some, I guess in the 70s. Well. <laughs> no, and well, I asked them, are these kids hothouse flowers? Because it had no <laughs> windows. And there were two schools in the city Literally, I'm not lying to you. Push, make me prove this to you at some later point. Or <laughs> literally designed by prison architects oh, in, the 70, in the 70s to be um, riot proof. Right. But you walk into a building, hall after hall after hall, dark, dark halls, and the kids with the, the um, most needs uh, are in these dark, dingy, gulag-like rooms that you would only think, you would never believe it if I told you that a nice, happy, shiny, beautiful place like Minneapolis would have such a room. And and the basement. Place, so. Most yeah, that's that's yeah. what I was about to say. The basement. Yeah. My my first principalship, you know, uh, the basement. It was looked at as the first floor, but it was, in all intents and purposes, it was it was the basement of the building. Um, there was only one class everywhere. You know, they used it for the shop classes, 
right? And so this wood shop, like that's, a, you know, this is like 1900, uh, 1920s building, same, you know, uh, mental institution uh, architect was the same one who Jesus. designed uh, a lot of our schools. <laughs> wow. Um, but the first floor slash basement that had no regular classroom, that's where the home ec was, that's where the wood shop was, you know, all the, those type of uh, rooms, because it was industrial, you know, uh, meant for industrialized, uh, you know, industrialization of the country. Yeah. And it was one classroom. Wow. A self-contained classroom, all boys. Wow. And, you know, and I'm just like, hey, this is, you know, this is problematic. Like, you know, and the teacher fought me on it. I was like, you know, <laughs> I was like, you can't stay down here. Like, this is, he's like, I've been here for years. They love it here. I'm like, what do you mean they love it here? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, why would you separate them from the entire three or four floors, three floors? Why would you separate them as the only and self-contained? I mean, they're there all day unless it's lunchtime, you mm -hmm. know, um, and then they're going to the gym and, and that kind of thing. I'd also love for you to talk about uh, universal design, because I think that's also just an important uh, piece about this when we're looking at children and the humanity of like just services and needs and, and, and so forth, um, um, particularly around, uh, you know, this topic. Yeah. And we, I also don't want to lose the educator piece because that's so important, but and, mm. and maybe, maybe there's a blending of those is that um, all of the things that we're talking about have been compounded by COVID. You know, we know that kids with disabilities have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. Um, we know that there are huge shortages of teachers um, that have specialized skills for kids with disabilities. I, this is not scientific at all, but I think we're going to see a huge I'm, I'm thinking 25% that we're going to see a just an explosion of kids in special ed. I think there'll be a slowdown this year and next. And then after that, there'll be a big uptick um, for all the reasons we've talked about that right now, kids have not spent a ton of time with teachers and there've been lots of disruptions. So I think we've missed a lot of referrals, but I think when we start to catch up and I think systems are going to be overwhelmed and not being able to educate kids. And we're going to see a, a, a significant increase in the number of kids who are being referred to special ed. Um, right when we don't, we're having shortages of teachers and we need general ed teachers in particular. I think the greatest lever is in uh, teacher prep programs in general ed and that we need to be training general educators and specifically with universal design in that we need to make sure that schools, classrooms, you know, are all designed to benefit all kids that were set up, you know, physically set up so that that they're universally accessible, but then also that the curriculum is set up in a way that teachers don't just teach it one way, but they can approach it in a couple different ways. But I think the universal design is something that should be one of the leading things taught in, in educator prep programs, as well as um, one of the key measures. And when we've seen charter schools that have been successful with kids with disabilities, it's because they've embraced the concept of uni universal design and they've made it, you know, baked it into the DNA of the school rather than seeing, oh, we're going to create our school and then we're going to create this other silo for kids with disabilities afterwards. But it's it's baked into it um, from the beginning. So, um, yeah, I'm a huge. I just think that that is, you know, that, you know, there's a there's a professor at the University of Mont Michael Giangreco who does cartoons around special ed. And he does one that you've probably seen that's a picture. Of course, it's a picture of snow because he's from Vermont. And it's the front of a school. And there's snow. And there's a student uh, who uses a wheelchair looking at the ramp. And then there's a set of staircases. And the, the child in the wheelchair is saying, can you shovel the ramp? And the, the person doing the shoveling says, well, let me shovel the stairs first. And then I'll shovel the ramp. And the cartoon is saying, well, if you shovel the ramp first, everyone can use the ramp. <laughs> And to me, that really captures universal design in a really succinct way. You know, I love that. Um, uh, and I'm trying to think of who it was. John Powell, I think, actually, years ago, uh, gave us a, a briefing on universal, targeted universalism. And I kept not being able to grasp the concept of what he was talking about. And he, he gave one example that has never left me. It stayed, stayed with me. And it was, you know, when you walk across the street through a crosswalk, there's that dip in the yeah. curve at the other end. And he's like, when you are 
running through New York or somewhere with your bag and you're trying to catch a cab or whatnot, that makes it so much easier. And you roll your little bag up and you get in a cab and you don't realize the fact that that actually was for people with disabilities because it actually is useful to everybody who uses it, even though they don't know that it, it was specifically targeted to help people with disabilities. And that actually made it so clear for me that there are ways in which we could design our society that actually does make it work equally well for everyone, but really targets the needs of the people that need to get up on the curb, <laughs> right? Like, you know, um, uh, I still haven't gotten the rest of his theory, but <laughs> that particular design kind of, it's nice that you have examples. Yeah. Uh, note, note to everybody's trying to teach people. Give them examples. <laughs> Give them examples. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, I think that's so important for schools, too, as you're envisioning, like, what the culture of the school is. And, then, you know, and some of like, you know, you have to be labeled and then they say, oh, you know, don't yell at that child because that may trigger them. They have a label. You know, they have IEP. Don't, you know, just like, how about we don't yell at children? We don't yell at any kids. You know, like, how, how about we just, like, most human beings don't like people who are anybody, but particularly if they're much larger much heavier and much more power yelling at them, you know, screaming at them, right? Like that's just, that's just basic decency, basic level of respect that can be baked into the call. And that's why school culture is like, you know, absolutely um, the most important foundation to, to build on. And that's where you get the academic gains, the, uh, the investment, the uh, partnerships and all that, because it's a, you know, the foundation of respect. I think that's what that's what all this is all about. Yeah, there those Michael Jane Greco's cartoons are so spot on. I'm gonna have to check those out. Yeah. yeah, they're who would have thought you could make a cartoon book about special ed? Um, but he just captures it. So, and they're actually now in the um he released them a couple of years ago, so they're open source. You can use them and put them inside decks, and he's he's just great. I hugely respect his work. And you said there's like, he has like a book, like a comic yeah. book, like Calvin and Hobbes type of thing. For yes, it. a Calvin and Hobbes type book around special ed. There you go. Nice. Here's a better view of it. Could you please help me shovel the ramp? All these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, I will clear the ramp for you. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> and I will help you. But if you shovel the ramp, says uh, <laughs> says the person who knows a little more than you, we can all get in. Gee, what a thought. <laughs> um, I love it. I yeah, love shout it. out to Vermont Public Radio. There you go. I live uh, in Vermont, so. Do you really? <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. I love UVM. Vermont. Yeah. yeah Yesterday. Well, it's, um, I don't know if it's cold or Minnesota or, you, or Vermont right now. Oh, God, we are definitely cold. <laughs> what, a, uh, what, a, but, what a bad designation to even try to win. You know, you like, know what? <laughs> listen, hey, it keeps the riffraff out. Um, so listen, uh, um, Vermont yesterday showed up on a list as number one in the country. There was this list that came out uh, Matt Chingos at, I believe, Urban Institute is, yeah. uh, put out something that ranked states on uh, uh, access of Black students to teachers that are highly qualified, more experienced teachers and more qualified teachers. And Vermont was number one. Uh, it's one of five <laughs> states. It was one of five states where Black students actually have greater access to experienced teachers than white students do. So there are five states that yeah, have at all, five, are you, all ten of those students. <laughs> all ten of those black students are with this one high highly qualified team. Talk about skewed data, like this. <laughs> I, I would listen. Do, I'll take it. Yeah, no, I, I will take it too because Vermont. There, Vermont has its well, lots of amazing things about Vermont, but also lots of challenges. And diversity is not one of our strengths. So, no, actually, the, uh, Vermont, because I went to college in Vermont, I actually oh. happen to know that Vermont is um, is a nation leader in the incarceration of Black people uh, yeah. in terms of rates also. So there you go. You get yeah. access to better traffic teachers stops. and you still go to jail. So <laughs> Yeah, I know. Um, they said and, even during COVID, traffic stops totally dropped off, but the disproportionality of traffic stops um, were held true that Still, and as you said, they're not that many people of color in Vermont, but they're the ones getting pulled over. No, you're pulling you over. They're just knocking on your door saying, hey, I'm sorry, we got to arrest you because like, yeah. <laughs> like, listen, we know there's COVID, but our numbers are down. Yeah. Um, you know, you've mentioned a couple of times this COVID. You said something in there that I thought was really profound or actually alarming uh, that COVID you're going to you think that because of COVID, there's going to be an outbreak 
or I don't know if outbreak's the right word, but a massive increase in the number of students that are identified as needing special education services. Uh, and why would that be? Like, why would a pandemic increase the number of people that would yeah. be considered to be disabled? Yeah, so this is this is me, like a lot, like everyone right now, we're trying to look at the tea leaves and understand what are the implications of COVID and then how do we, how do we plan for it? I think the current round of Omicron is showing us that when we don't plan, how many problems? So as I think about it, I think there are a couple factors. I think one is overall, not just in schools, but overall COVID is creating more, you know, COVID is having an impact in creating more people with disabilities, long-term COVID. So there's that issue. Less so for kids who are school age, but just overall. But I think my hypothesis is that right now we are, we know that there's a backlog of referrals and we know that teachers are spending less time with kids. And one of the ways kids are referred for special ed is that teachers spend time with them and they see how they're doing and they detect that there's a problem and they say, wow, you know, I've taught this lesson six different ways and Johnny still can't seem to decode. I, I think there might be uh, dyslexia or, you know, there's a processing order. We want to provide more support. So we don't have as much interaction. So I think there's going to be a delay. I think we're going to see some drop-offs maybe in for this year. But then I think when we start to come back on a more normal basis and teachers spend more time with kids and start to observe and see issues, I think we're going to see a lot of referrals. And I think a lot of referrals in, in kind of those more subjective categories. So actually kids with disabilities, but also kids that simply haven't received, have had completely just disruptive instruction for two years that are going to get referred to special ed because the general ed teacher doesn't feel they can accelerate their learning. I think it'll be compounded by the fact that we have shortages and, and we know that when teachers are overwhelmed and they've got large class sizes, which I think is one of the byproducts of the shortages of staff, that teachers are going to say, I don't know if this kid has a disability, but I know I got 35 kids in my class and these five kids are just you know, they're hugely disruptive and they're causing me problems and I can't serve them. So I'm going to refer them to special ed out of hope that someone else is going to be able to get them more services. So when I put those things together, they, they tell me that I, and we've already seen special ed numbers were already in the uptake. The last few years, we went from like an average of 13% to now 14%, which when you're looking at the universe of all kids, that's a big increase. And I just think with COVID, we're going to continue to see bigger increases. So poke holes in my hypothesis, but that's what I think. No, I, I mean, I won't poke holes in it. And uh, Sharif, I'll ask you what you think. I, I personally believe that it would be great if there was a national august body of people who were actually keeping on their radar all of the fallout yeah. from all these different, because it's complex information. There's a lot of data to go through. There needs to be people at a very high level constantly thinking about this. It feels like we're just trying to keep the roof on right now. It feels like we're just doing everything we can do every day, day by day to keep schools open and to keep, but in terms of thinking in the more meta thinking, the bigger picture, yeah. what you just said shouldn't just be a hypothesis. It should be somebody's project at a very high level in the government to say, how can we five years from now not wish that we had done something more today, yeah. right? Like we're good, cause I, I think nothing has come home to roost yet. We're gonna have a couple of years I honestly believe we can't just have an entire generation of people having lost days of learning, lost days, are, are more mental health needs, more isolation, uh, more teacher and educator burnout, uh, less kind of coherence in terms of curriculum mm -hmm. and scope and sequence and what was being delivered. Like all these things, when you add them up, like it should just be some big red glaring sign. Oh yeah, this needs some expert attention. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's right. not a question. That's just no, like a that's, statement. that's a statement, exclamation no. point, uh, double click, you know, whatever. Um, and and it's uh, and I think too many times it's up to individual schools and leadership teams to mm -hmm. try to navigate it. And so they're doing it on their own uh, with overwhelmed, short staffed, overwhelmed staff and then often uh, lack of support. You know, you, I, I could not tell you how many times I've heard from school leaders who say, you know, when you ask about situations like this, the complexity, even pre-pandemic, they were looking mm -hmm. on Google and stuff, you know, to try to find answers. You know, they were it, it wasn't some kind of clearinghouse in their district or in their network or their CMO. It was like, oh, what's my personal 
uh, connections and network and let me try to find, which is, there's a place for that, right? You know, peer to peer learning, but that shouldn't be the system. <laughs> like, you know, Hey, you're on your own, but like, just like we tell, te- you know, you hear the saying of telling teachers like, Oh, you threw them in sink or swim. That's how, that's what, that's how we treat the people who are um, paid to care for some of our most vulnerable citizens in the, in the country, sink or swim, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and that is like, if that ain't damning, you know, for just a future of any society. Um, I don't know what is. Yeah, what what we're trying to do in the work that we do is try to talk to, to states and to districts and charters about how they're spending their ESSER dollars and making investments in training for general ed teachers around differentiation and identification and understanding, you know, are you seeing- And mindset. And yeah, oh, mindset, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, to not look at a child and say, wow, they have this deficit. So I'm going to put them over here. It's wow. I can see that child is struggling. My job is to say, are they struggling because they haven't had consistent quality instruction for two years? Or are they struggling because there's actually, uh, you know, a processing or a cognitive issue that they're struggling with and someone who needs, has more specialized expertise needs to help. So I think it's training around general educators. And I also think it's making an investment so that, that there's something in between that you can get a child more intensive supports without for too long, the only way to get kids more intensive supports was to put them in special ed. And is there a way to really limit the kids who are served in special ed to those kids who have really significant disabilities and really get and have the other kids that have milder disabilities be able to stay in the general ed classroom and simply get more supports. Um, but unfortunately, because of funding and the way we have set things up, we really have this siloed system that you're, it's it's binary. It's you're one or the other when really mm-hmm. it's far more nuanced than that. Um, I also want to point out that something that we've really pushed is, is just the lack of data. Like there's brand new data out of NWEA about showing um, the gap and the learning losses. And you look at those reports, there's not even a mention of kids with disabilities even though on average it's 14% of the student population. And so- uh, No mention at all? You, I, I looked at the most recent NWA report and it you know, continued to, to say what we've seen all along mm-hmm. that there's greater loss in math and in reading and the greater loss in, in uh, kids at the early years. And I, you know, this is one of the things I do. I get these big reports and I Google, I'm like IEP, special ed, disability, exceptional not a single mention of kids with disabilities in these reports. So there's lack of data is just a huge issue and that too often diversity doesn't include disability and that we only talk about, um, you know, we we do some subgroups, but we don't look at all subgroups. I think this is a really important call out. I see uh, Andrew Campanella from National School Choice Week is in the comments. He says, this is super helpful. Our team is watching and we'll be updating our guide to special education with some of the information from this show. That's like what you call information and action, you know, um, and I love it. So let's, uh, let's put a challenge out to all our other, uh, you know, friends and allies within the field that is known as educational advocacy or whatever we want to call it to do a better job in all of their reports, their, um, their guides that they put out for parents, uh, there's just parent fever right now. As a matter of fact, everybody wants parents to uh, to find what's great for them and whatnot. And are we talking about all parents? Are we talking about the parents uh, of all students? And um, I like the call out that you just made. And I love that Andrew responded like, <laughs> like that and made a change. Yeah, so there it's... is the power of discussion uh, does uh, does work. Now for my school choice people, especially when they put out guides, I really hope you're doing a good job of this also. Like, you know, school choice... Uh, uh, should be uh, it should be inclusive, a very all inclusive. I would like to say this about Ed Choice, uh, who I've uh, who I've looked to in terms of their guides for different things. It wasn't until I started looking at their guides that I knew just how many school choice programs nationally are specifically geared at students with disabilities. I actually had always heard that you know voucherizing things and ESAs and all of that uh, would do uh, uh, un- would do harm. Yeah, we uh, didn't even get it to APS. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I didn't know how many state uh, choice programs literally are for uh, for students that have very specific disabilities in different states. It's very different, but 
uh, I want to say it was like 40% of the programs are, are like that. I see Lauren, you want to jump in on that. So tell me <laughs> and jump yeah, in. Yeah, it's, um, boy, you know, there is decades of research that educating kids with disabilities in the general ed classroom with their peers is the optimal learning environment. It, 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 it enables them both socially, emotionally to be with their peers, enables them to have time with the teacher who's got the greatest content knowledge. And while there are a small percentage of kids with disabilities who do get educated in more separate settings, I get nervous, to be honest, when we start, we start creating more programs that are 100% kids with disabilities, which I'm, I'm making a leap a little bit from what you said. I think what you're referring to is that there are a lot of voucher programs that like the McKay voucher program, which I'm not sure if it's even called that in Florida now, um, but a number of states have programs that are voucher programs explicitly designed for kids with disabilities. It sounds good, except when you drill down, a lot of those schools are still able to reject kids. There's not really any accountability when they exercise. Like try to dig down into McKay in Florida and those vouchers and understand outcomes and progress and, and who, which kids are able to enroll and which kids are not able to enroll. And I get, um, I want to make sure that all parents are able to exercise choice and that as school choice grows, it doesn't mean that, it means that parents get greater choice and that schools aren't choosing kids. And that if we're using public dollars, that all kids can benefit from those public dollars and not just the kids that, that those private schools want. So it's not a bright line because like I said, I'm from Vermont. Vermont's had vouchers for years and years and years just because we're a rural state and we've got communities with those schools. But I think if public dollars flow, then kids, sh that schools shouldn't be able to reject kids. And there should be some accountability mechanism so that and some transparency so kids can parents can assess the quality of the schools so when you say that you mean like they shouldn't be able to um reject kids on the basis of a disability but yeah i mean all schools reject kids they sort kids in one way or another right yeah. like we talked about magnets at the beginning yeah, magnets, exactly yeah uh, and the magnet schools in connecticut can literally um discriminate on the basis of race they can tell you we yeah. have too many black kids in this building yeah. now and no more black kids can come in yeah. um but but we never it never hits our radar that there are literally schools in the united states in 2022 that can tell a black kid because you're black you can't come in this school and I, I i would point people to new haven connecticut because that yeah. literally is happening right now no, and I, I, I think you've, that's a problem. And I, and I feel like for kids with disabilities, like when you say that out loud, society looks at them and says, that is wrong. Like clearly racism is a huge issue in this country. There's no, but at least there's an acknowledgement and awareness that it's wrong, even if it's still going on. When you talk about ableism and our level of comfort discriminating against kids with disabilities, people do it openly because they don't think it's even wrong. So there's, there's still, there's a lot of work to be done to address the level of comfort we collectively have on failing kids and adults with disabilities and low expectations and the ableism that is so rampant, um, you know, and I'm, across the board, that there's still a level of comfort, you know, and I could I can share lots of examples of, well, yeah, we're low performing, but that's just some of our kids with disabilities we are we're fine for other kids. And I was like, well, right. that's <laughs> we would be a great school system if it wasn't for those kids. Yeah, uh, no, and I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, and yeah. I would push, push a little bit. Like I think it's plenty of people are pretty comfortable being racist too. I can take you to a lot of state houses. They are, yes. you know, they're like, what? That's what you think racism is. Watch this. Hold yeah. my beer. Here's a new bill. Right. Like, yeah. so, and yeah. then you layer that a black, brown child, indigenous child who also has special needs. And you talk about you know we talk about intersectionality yeah. a lot, yeah. Um, but it doesn't always come to term with you know uh, race and um, and needs, you know, special ed needs, right? Like, and that to me is a uh, you know um, a huge part of the where that's also okay, right? I mean, we see the type of schools they send to. We see the you know generally they should have some of the best educators, some of the best schools. Generally not. They get the, they get the base. They get the 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 most apartheid. I'm gonna make up a word. 
the most apartheid uh, state of being, um, that the chances are they're the ones that's going to uh, experience that. And not just for a week, a day, but 12, 13 years. Well, a lot of them, unfortunately, we know they don't even last 13 years. That's all the years. Right. Like, yeah. 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 High dropout rates and low graduation rates, low persistence in college. Yeah, I mean, it's and high incarceration. Yeah, huge. I, I mean, I want to, for some reason, 76% is jumping out in my head, but like a, a you know, hugely disproportionate percentage of the people who are incarcerated um, have disabilities. So it's just, you know, the cause and effect is very clear. Well, I love this discussion. Um, right. And we have come to the, the end of our time, but Lauren, hopefully you will come back. Oh, and we can continue the conversation because I think we unpacked a couple of issues here that uh, I think warrant further discussions, yeah. uh, more I, learning. I just have to give a quick shout out. My team, we are such huge fans. And I can't tell you, a couple of my staff members were just green with envy that I was going to get to spend <laughs> an hour with four of the eight black hands. That so was such a pleasure. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Uh, we'll thank them <laughs> for watching, and we really work. appreciate yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, we always appreciate co uh, uh, what I continually call communal learning opportunities, and for us to um, not have our expertise live just within people. Sharif has said this a lot when uh, when people pass away. Oftentimes, that's like what, I think Sharif, you said it's like the burning down of a, a library. A library, yeah. yeah. Yeah, when a person, uh, I think it's there's no bigger crime than having exceptional knowledge and not sharing it and um, not making the world kind of less dumb. Because um, uh, right now we have kind of like a pandemic of dumb uh, in the world. Uh, and it would be nice for, um, for the smart people to reclaim center stage and make the public smarter rather than the people who exploit their blind spots and their ignorances, specifically around how people are marginalized. Uh, none of us should be okay with mar marginalization anywhere. Uh, and you shouldn't be able to say, well, that's not me or my population, so why should I care? That's not being human, first of all. That's uh, you're part of the problem, uh, if that's what's happening. Uh, so I appreciate discussions like this. Today we have talked to uh, Lauren Miranda Rim, who's the executive director and co-founder of the Center for Learner Equity, formerly the National Center for Special Education uh, in Charter Schools. It's a nonprofit that was launched in 2013 that is devoted to ensuring that students with disabilities are able to access and thrive in traditional and charter public schools. Uh, Lauren, I believe I'm your second Twitter uh, follower. Uh, on, 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 uh, yeah, on see, 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 I take, uh, yeah. Oh, I, I actually I, think you went to the, I think you were directed to the wrong account. I believe I have more than two followers. So it's, my handle is LMR HIM. I'll put it in the, I see, like you just dashed my dreams. <laughs> I, I just right, wanted no. to be, well, you're following somebody, so that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was an erroneously uh, connected account. So, um, I'm still going to live in my head that I was number two. I, but I, go I, ahead. I, I do want if people you're to find you. I feel so honored. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how can people find you? Because I think that is uh, what we really want. We want people to find yeah. you, locate your work, and locate your report. So, tell people how to find you. So uh, the Center for Learner Equity. So just Google us and, you know, in our, in our, uh, my Twitter feed is at LMRHIM, which is my initials, or at uh, Learner Equity. Um, so those are our two Twitter handles and just our website and, you know, reach out if you have questions. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're most active on Twitter on our website. Um, but yeah, no, just thanks for yeah. elevating the issue. Really appreciate the conversation. Appreciate you too. If um, when you do go to the uh, Center for Learner Equity .org, which is their website, you will see you can see that there's a report called uh, Secondary Analysis of Civil Rights Data Collection to Inform Policy and Practice. That's what we've been discussing today. I would encourage you to. Um, there's a graphic there that lays out the areas of focus and the key findings, and it's it's brief and able uh, for you to share. Uh, ready, readily able for you to share, available for you to share. Please share it. That's that's how information in the world works. It's not going to take you very long. This is your form of activism for today. If you want to do one good thing on a Friday today, I would challenge you just to do this, just to go out and do this today uh, and uh, share the information. Sharif, thank you for another uh, enlightening weekend, my brother. Pleasure, Appreciate man. you. My pleasure. And um, this was really helpful. Thanks. Sue.
Excellent. Thank you Thank who you. have come and listened and watched us today. Uh, as always, this has been Freedom Friday, but you are still not free, but hopefully you're freer after this hour with Sharif El-Meki, uh, Lauren and me. Have a great day. We appreciate you all.